once again to the course grind podcast this is episode seven i am your host sean rosler uh episode six wonderful introduction to the world of cheese and today it's going to be a little different as well as we look into one of my other favorite worlds and that is booze so my guest today every so often you know the stars have a wonderful way of aligning themselves and i've found this to be ever more true when it comes to guests that we have right here on the course grind podcast on a recent vacation to Ocean City, Maryland, my wife and I made our way out for a date night to a place we'd driven by many times but never stopped at, and that place is the Sky Bar atop Galaxy 66 in Ocean City, Maryland. Posh, slick, and sleek, and modern. Imagine our amazement when the warmth we were greeted, served, and conversed to with rivaled some of the most traditional, intimate environments we'd ever dined in. Then, of course... We found out why. Our bartender server was not just some random run-of-the-mill slinger of booze. Oh, no. He was a foodie, a veritable encyclopedia of all things spirits and spiritual, crowned Ocean City's best bartender for, and I'm going to have to get the year corrected with my guest here, it, whether it was 2013 or 14, and he's my guest today, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, the commander-in-chief of all things boozy and foodie at Sky Bar in Ocean City, Maryland, Mr. Keith Raffensperger. Keith, how are you, sir? I'm great, Sean. Thanks. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. How are things in uh, slowly but surely not as sunny Ocean City? It's this is the the transition season. It's starting to wind down a little bit, but it's still uh still still pretty busy. Things are things are good. Yes, and it was awesome. uh it, awesome. and it was 2014, as a matter of fact. 2014. That's what I thought it was, but I didn't want to speak out of turn. I knew it was a big deal. That's all I knew for certain. <laughs> so, um, Keith, as we discussed before, we're going to run through three sections of questions. Uh, you know, we we've already established you're this massive uber super slinger of the bar, but I want to know more about your angle on food. So we're going to start off with some where you came from questions. We're going to go to some where you are questions, and then we'll transition into some uh, perhaps out-of-the-box questions um, regarding all things culinary. So without further ado, Keith, where did you grow up eating? Um, I grew up outside of Baltimore in a, in a suburb in Baltimore County. And I, uh, I got the restaurant bug early on. There was a really nice uh, fine dining restaurant just minutes from my house that I started as a dishwasher in the early 80s and then moved on to busboy and then I waited tables there. And then I worked in the kitchen for several years before moving to Ocean City. So that's where I, that's where I kind of got the, uh, the restaurant and food and, and the high-end uh, dining bug. Yeah. And, 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 you know, so often when you read and hear things um, from the realm of the culinary, that's that's how so many of the greats truly, you know, got in. It's just it's not so much maybe necessarily being formally trained, although I'm sure that doesn't hurt. But just being around it and being immersed in it, it it's, it's kind of like learning a foreign language. You know, you could sit in a classroom, but you could also be in it. And I, I, I would imagine that that immersion definitely made that bug all the more powerful for you. Absolutely. I mean, I did, I did go to culinary school and I have a couple of degrees from there, but it was, it was my experience in the business and actually, and things I learned from my mom watching her growing up that I really, uh, that I got it all from. I mean, it, it, you know, you can, you can sit in a classroom all day, every day of your life, but until you're doing it hands on, it's really, it's still just in theory until you're doing it, but I, I love it. Cool, cool. So, I mean, you truly had the best of both worlds there. So you mentioned um, y your mom and watching her growing up. So as as a young guy, what kind of an eater were you? Were you picky or were you pretty open to everything? I, I was I was the youngest of three and I was really open to everything. And, and my mom was pretty excited when I came along because prior to me, my father, brother and sister were not, a little more on the picky side. But um, my mother used to tell the story of me being three years old and sitting there eating raw oysters with her, you know, and ordering liver and onions in a diner. And so, uh, so yeah, I was always pretty willing to try anything. And uh, so, it was, you know, a lot of times my mom and I would be eating something that the rest of the family wouldn't, and then they'd see how much fun we were having. And eventually, uh, everybody kind of came around. <clears throat> yeah, for sure, for sure. I I, I have a uh, I have a six now seven year old who who. Uh, likes clams and oysters and i thought i was doing well but i i, th I think a three-year-old eating raw oysters might might be a record of some kind i'm gonna have to check 
Um, <laughs> so, so as a three-year-old, he, he, here you are eating raw oysters. Are there are, are, are there foods from that period that, that you think back to that you really feel? There's a scene actually in uh, Ratatouille, and you know both you and I are dead, so I, I would imagine you saw this movie where the food critic, the real kind of mean, nasty food critic, eats this simple peasant dish, and it takes it back home for him. It, are, are there foods that make you feel the same way? You know, yes, there are, and and I'm, I'm now visualizing that scene vividly when the uh, when the food critic flashes back to his childhood. Um, there there are certain things, um, and it was it was more, more the simplistic uh, you know comfort homey food like like meatloaf. You know, every once in a while I'll smell something that'll just trigger a memory from my childhood. Or uh, last Christmas, my wife was baking Christmas cookies, and I walked in the house, and it it was I flashed back to my childhood, my my own mother. So uh, some of the she was my mom was more into the baking. I I can't do that; it's too exact a science. But uh, but liver and onions. Whenever I smell liver and onions being cooked, I, that flashed me back to my childhood and my mother and I dining together. So. Yeah, there's def- there are definitely yeah. some triggers. Yeah, but like you said, it's that scene where he he t- he takes one bite, and then sometimes it's not even the bite; it's that smell, and so you know that that really takes yeah. you back. And that's you know w- when w- when people can do that, I think you realize the true spiritual nature. You know that that is food. So. So, so growing up, I'm I'm getting the feeling that your mom was your greatest culinary influence, and and, and if she was, why? And if not, who was and why? Uh, you know what she definitely was, and every um, like holidays and the meals were always always an event. Like if I if I think back to Christmases from my childhood, I can actually remember the the sights and smells and tastes of of the food more so than I can like specific gifts. And uh, pretty much everybody in my family kind of cooked. My father not so much, but uh, my brother, who was about a decade older than me, he went to culinary school as well. So when he was off at of culinary school, you know, I was about 10, 11 years old. So and he was he was one of my idols. So I kind of always wanted to be like my brother. Anyway, so between him and my mother, and like I said, I got a real early start in the business, and I just I just became infatuated with. Uh, with just food and, and just up rent dining. I mean, one of my first jobs I was doing, you know, table side cooking and it was really, it was, it, it just got under my skin and it's just, you know, ever since then I've just had a love of food. Mm-hmm. And, you know, table side cooking, that's, you know, while, while maybe not exact as baking, uh, my wife and I were just in Jim Thorpe where, where they do a, a, a bunch of table side dishes, including uh cherry's Jubilee, Dover Soul, and, while while maybe it's not as exact a science, I mean, you, you've got to be on your game to do that. Is that correct? Um, yes, because that one, uh, it's I mean, when you're you're hidden behind kitchen doors, uh, you have some luxuries that you don't when you're out uh, essentially on stage. Um, so and you've seen where I work, we actually have an exhibition kitchen, which there was a time in life when I was a full time kitchen guy that I was like, I don't think I ever want to do that. <laughs> Just. Uh, <laughs> Just wanted to know that if I cut my finger, I could either grimace or curse. But um, but yeah, when you're in, in either an exhibition kitchen or out in the dining room, uh, wheeling out the Gyarados, you gotta you gotta have your game on because you're a showman in addition to to uh, to preparing food. So sure, absolutely, absolutely. And so um, you know, he, he, here you were immersed in it early, and and, and you mentioned that that you went to culinary school. Um, where was it that you went to culinary school and what kind of a student were you? So often when I speak to people who have gone to culinary school, they're either, they were either a 10 or a one, they either loved it or hated it. So which, which were you? Um, it's, it's interesting. So I went to culinary school in Baltimore and I, um, like all growing up elementary school, high school, I was a horrible student. Um, awful but in culinary school i i turned it around i i basically carried a three eight and i think the reason being as shallow and petty as it seems is because i paid for my own college <laughs> and suddenly when it had a price tag coming out of my wallet i started taking things seriously um and and i i also when i went there i'd already worked in restaurants for like six years a lot of the people i went to culinary school with had never even worked in a restaurant they just decided this is what they wanted to do so they're going to culinary school and they didn't seem to really have a, a grasp of it. me i was taking what i had already been doing and honing my skills and learning the hows the whys and the what fors um 
So yeah, I had I, I had an advantage going in that I already had a love of the restaurant business and the food, and this was you know my way of learning more. So I did I actually took it seriously and I did really well in school. That's great. That's really great. So so Keith, that's that's where you've come from. That's 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 what made you who you are today. And now the transition into where you are today, it's it's kind of making me laugh now, realizing that when you were three year old three years old, you were eating the raw oysters. And the moment where I realized, hey, I really want to have this guy on, was when you were giving me the lowdown on three different types of oysters, and they elude me right now. But every single word of advice you gave me was so spot on. So I, I find that incredibly – I don't know if it's ironic. I don't want to get into the, to the Alanis Morissette argument of what is <laughs> irony and what is not irony. But it's certainly funny. It, it, it's very funny. Um, so fast-forwarding to current day, you know, here you are in the gorgeous – I cannot emphasize this enough – Sky Bar – um, at Galaxy 66, Ocean City, on the Strip. Check it out if you're there. Um, you know, here you are in this gorgeous open air joint, giving these recommendations. You know, for for what you want to eat, what you don't want to eat. Um, but when when you cook, and w- whether it be there, whether it be at home, um, where do you draw your culinary inspiration from? You know, when when you're creating a drink, there's there's that drink that you made with the grapefruit liqueur. I don't know if it was a liqueur or higher than that. Do you remember the one I'm talking about? We, it was it the uh, uh, we have a few different with fresh squeezed grapefruit. There was one called a Big Bang. That was it's a uh, it's a grapefruit flavored vodka and fresh squeezed grapefruit. Is that the one? Top with club soda. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think it was the grapefruit vodka that you got specific. Like, I had never seen it before. And, you mm-hmm. know, here again, I, I found this amazing. There are actually you are a few, in, diff- in, in there are a few different brands now. now. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, you, you know, sometimes, you know, making drinks can seem so, like, cornered. And, and yet here you are bringing this bottle out and – I had never seen it before, and I don't claim to be the the be all end all, but I found it amazing that not only here you are with such a grasp on the food that the place had to offer, but, but I mean the drinks were your own. So so when you're making food and when you're making drink, what what is it that you draw from? Um, you know it, it's interesting you ask that because specifically when I'm when I'm cooking, I'm my, one of my problems is. A lot of times if I make something really well, I have trouble duplicating it because I don't know what I did. I, I can't follow a recipe if my life depends on it. But put me in a room, show me a counter with a bunch of ingredients and say, hey, make me a meal out of this. I, I got no problem with that. I could do it. I just wish I could remember how I did it and repeat it. But um, a lot of it is, like I was saying, some of it is, you know, flavors and, and, and memories from my childhood. Um, most of it's just kind of winging it. Uh, and... And uh, and with making drinks, um, I mean, there's a uh, there's a, a creativity to a point, but a lot of it is just repetition, um, you know, and and, and consistency. I, I I guess I take a little more pride in the in the in the drink making and consistency there because that's what I'm doing professionally now. We're cooking. I'm only I'm really only cooking at home anymore, and uh, which I love. When I was when I was working 60, 70 hours a week in the kitchen, the last thing in the world I wanted to do at home was cook. But now on my day off, that's all I do want to do. <laughs> cook and play with my kids so nice nice yeah yeah making making drinks professionally to the point that you are the greatest bartender in ocean city for the 2014 year no big deal right (laughs) well that was uh that was kind of ironic it was and in fact that magazine just came out two days ago um as the coastal style magazine i don't know if i'm allowed to mention that sorry um but uh, yeah. somebody was kind of hazing me about that. They said, what did you do, stuff the ballot? I said, I didn't even know that was a thing until I got an email telling me that I had won it. And so uh, <laughs> I'm not sure who's voting for this stuff, but apparently uh, yeah, I did okay, at least for the year. Very, very smart people are voting on that, Keith. Very smart people. So, again, well done. Well done. <laughs> I know about that. Um, so, yeah. So, 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 I mean, you have a, you know, lengthy – solid, awesome career. What has been your greatest creation that you've made? Now, whether it be food or drink, what is something that has the Keith stamp on it that you are like the most proud of? Um, 
You know what? I won't say that it's the thing I'm the most proud of, but there's one that's that's become kind of a, a signature of mine. That whenever uh, whenever anybody is having an event, a cookout, a, a family gathering, anybody anybody in this area, relatives or friends or any of mine, where it's going to be a potluck thing, there's always a request for me to make my potato salad. Um, which I know it doesn't, that's not real lofty for a guy with a culinary degree and a chef certification, but it's kind of a, a hybrid of my mother's potato salad as a child that I've kind of added my own twist to it. But I, I actually do get requests for it very often. But the thing I'm kind of most proud of that I made one time, and this, it actually came to me in the shower. Um, I do a, uh, I'll, I'll do a pork loin that I basically butterfly it out and stuff it and then you get a pinwheel effect at the end and get goat cheese and wild rice and sauteed spinach and all kinds of it. I made that one time just on a whim and it turned out pretty well. So uh, I'll do that two or three times a year too. But I, I was pretty proud of that one. But oddly enough, it's my, <laughs> it's my potato salad that gets the most requests. No, I don't think I, 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 I don't see that as odd at all because it goes back to, the scene in Ratatouille. You, you can you can make you know something mm -hmm. with you know oyster foam and you know whatever. That's that's all well and good, but it's that thing that harkens back. And I think you know a lot of people have potato salad in their back pocket. You know, I don't think a lot of people's moms were you know heading up a professional kitchen. And if they were, good on them. But that that potato salad, that <laughs> kind of thing, harkens back. It's accessible. It's you know, everybody's there with it. So I, I don't I don't find that surprising and God I'd love to try it sometime. Next time I'm down. Hey, let me know when you're gonna be in town. I'll make a batch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Hey, what in your opinion? Now obviously, you know, he, here you are on the front line of, of of both food and drink. Um and trends come and trends go. What do you think is gonna be the next big thing? And, and again, this can be in either food or drink. What do you think is going to be the next trend? That's an interesting question. It's a, I always I'm always trying to look one or two two steps down the road. Um, and I used to read all the trade magazines, and then I had more children, and and I no longer have that luxury. So uh, unless they can squeeze some restaurant trends into Dr. Seuss books, uh, I'll uh, subliminally I'm a little a little behind on the trends. But it seems to me like. Uh, like the the microbrew thing is taken off again, you know, uh, this uh, craft beers that sort of thing, and small badge bourbons seem to be seem to be popping up right now. And again, like I said, when I used to spend all my free time reading the trade magazines, I was a little more adept at at being able to answer this question. But now I'm just going by what I'm seeing from the front lines. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Craft craft beer, craft craft bourbon, craft liquor. Um, I, I I definitely think think it has it has a grip and I, I I don't know being being where you're at do you think craft beer has kind of gotten carried away with itself or do you think it's at a good place? Um, you know what I think it's brought I think it's brought a wide fan base to the beer world. Um, I mean whether these people genuinely like it or not because there was you know a few years back it was the, the flavored vodka and then you know a decade or so ago everybody some of the things become part of the expression sort of bastardized like all of a sudden anything that came in a stemmed up glass was a martini so that started the whole cosmo and all, all that uh that thing so and and sometimes you think it's you know do these people generally like the drinks or they just like the glass that it's in and uh it's a, it's the same with craft beers some people they're you know there's there's genuine beer drinkers then there's the kind of snobs and then there's the the tagalongs but you know and all and there's also now that there's such a wide range of the crafts and stuff they're adding flavors to it so i mean you got you know ladies are drinking you know the brews that wouldn't wouldn't have been otherwise i mean you got your ciders and, and that sort of stuff and you know some lambics and so it, it just it, it's basically broadened the fan base of uh of of beers um so that's kind of interesting to watch you know people that would have once been drinking you know wine or uh or a Cosmo, or, you know, now knocking back a craft brew. It's interesting. And how well-timed, too, was this, this resurgence of cider with the seeming unfortunate insurgence of gluten sensitivity? 
uh, I, I've noticed that that couldn't have been more well timed for the cider people. It worked out really, really well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you can't even get through a half of a football game without seeing a commercial for at least two or three different cider drinks now. Um, right. So yeah, they seem to have uh, hitched their wagon at the right time. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, uh, so so speaking of trends, there, there are good trends and there are bad trends. Um, what what trend or shall we say unfortunately popular idea thing or concept in either food or drink um, are you ready to see go away? Like it's here right now, it's really popular, but you hate it. <laughs> What's out there? <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, that's. That's almost a loaded question. <laughs> you know what? You can be you know, honest. I don't, okay, I can't speak for all bartenders, but I think I'll speak for most. I kind of every time I make a mojito, I just want to exhume Ernest Hemingway's corpse and bludgeon it with a copy of Old Man of the Sea. I don't know what it is about that thing that just irritates us. <laughs> you know, I, nobody made a mojito for like 50 years. Then all of a sudden, I don't know if somebody mentioned it on Oprah or something. Now everybody wants a mojito for the last three years. And it's just just something about the act of muddling mint. And then once the person leaves, you dump the sink the, the uh, leftover glass in the sink and then the mint clogs up your sink. It's just a bartender's nightmare. And it's really not that difficult to drink. It's just everything about it is a nuisance. And, and I just, I, you know what? I wish mojitos would go away. And it was a good book, by the way. But, I, I, know, I, I, I had to, I had to tie yeah. in. <laughs> I think any drink that you have to muddle anything. Muddle just sounds like something you do after a bad night of Mexican. Like, you get up in the morning in a model. Like it's just not good. So yeah, I I agree. While I enjoy a mojito, do not get me wrong. And I actually I was introduced to them by a, a friend of ours back in we had just gotten married like 2003 2004. Um, and you know I thought they were good. I didn't think they were amazing. But I I hear what you're saying. I see those so commonly now. And anytime skinny girl makes a bottle of something you know it's trendy. Oh. And so when I saw a skinny girl mojito, I'm like, Jesus, make it go away. <laughs> yes. So. You, I, I couldn't so, agree uh, more. You know what? I don't I don't mind frozen drinks. I don't mind fresh squeezed drinks, but something about muddling, it just irritates me. <laughs> <laughs> Muddle. It's the word. It's the word. So, it, it all is. right. So, Keith, you know, here, here you are. The, literally at the top of the world, you know, that view, I cannot express it enough. Amazing. Um, looking down the road, two, three, five years, what's next for you? I mean, are you happy where you're at? Are you going to, you know, go somewhere else, stay the same, but do something different? What's what's your plan? Um, another interesting question. Um it's funny. I say all the time, sort of half tongue in cheek, that I came to the beach for senior week and and never left. Um, and uh, for years, a lot of the the guys I went to high school with used to kind of haze me about that. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, he's still at the beach, still slinging drinks, and you know, just calling me Peter Pan and such. And then last year, I went to my 25 year reunion, and all of a sudden, all these same guys are looking at me, going, Oh my God, I'd give anything to be you. So <laughs> it's uh, I mean, you saw the view from my office. I can look left. I'm looking over the Atlantic. I look right. I'm looking over the the uh, Ass Woman Bay. You know, it's uh, not a bad view from from anyone's office. You know, let alone when. When, when uh, you do what I do, I mean, what's not to love? Hey, I'm perhaps not the loftiest yeah. profession, but you know, I, there was a time for 30 years. All I wanted to do was own my own restaurant, and now, I, you know, like I said, I remarried. I got a, I have some more kids now. My youngest just turned two. I have a three year old. So the thought of the of going back to the 80 hundred hour work week is really not nearly as appealing as it once was. Um, I've also uh, taken on a side job as a, as a writer, and essentially, it's I, I write an almost autobiographical column about um, basically life through my eyes as daddy by day, bartender by night, and and it's uh, and that's starting to take off. So if I could if I could pursue the writing thing a little more, that would be that would be optimal. Give me a little time to more time to stay home with the kids and watch them grow up. Um, cause I just can't, I'm 44 now and the whole getting home at four o'clock in the morning, you know, is, uh, is not as, not as easy as it once was. And there's a narrow window between <laughs> closing bartender and opening daddy. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll always be in the business in some capacity cause I just, I need it in my life <laughs> for just to be around it. 
the entertainment factor of it and just the interaction with people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, so often I, I, I talk to people who are in it, then who leave it and can't stay away from it. So it's almost like this, you know, it's it, 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 it's kind of like the mob. They keep bringing me back. They keep bringing me back. So that's that's cool to hear. That's that's cool to hear that it means that much to you. Um, so the the last couple questions are the are the afters. They're the bit more out of the box. So just roll with me here. And uh, we'll see what we see. So I'm standing in your kitchen, uh, either professionally or, or, or at home. You pick. What music do I hear in your kitchen? Ooh. Ah, great question. Um, well, I guess if I, I mean, depending on what the what my company was, if I were having family over dinner, but well, it's usually Christmas music. But uh, if me in there alone creating at my best i think we're listening to pink floyd Floyd. excellent any particular album uh i mean the obvious answer is dark side um Mm -hmm. let's see yeah i'd probably dark side all right right on right on so How's your mouth in the kitchen? Like, if if your mouth was a movie in the kitchen, uh, are you G, PG, R? <laughs> well, I mentioned earlier how early in my career I wasn't a big proponent of the exhibition kitchen or the table side <laughs> service. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I also had three less children then, so I wasn't as good at editing and censoring myself. Now I'm, <laughs> now I'm pretty soft. I'd say now I'm a G, but there was a time when I was probably uh, at, 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 definitely R. <laughs> not definitely so are. Now, now, we're not regulated by the FCC or anything like this on this podcast, so I got to ask, was there a favorite bomb you used to drop in the kitchen? <laughs> um, huh. No, not really. It wasn't. I, I, I wish I was better prepared for this answer. I can't really think of a go to <laughs> phrase off the top of my head. I think it uh, normally would because normally when when you're dropping one in the kitchen is because you've done something stupid to either ruin something or hurt yourself. So I think uh, my right. go to was always sort of a F me. <laughs> right, right, right. Awesome. I got you. I got you. So, all right, you're going to be stranded on a deserted island. Picture this, if you will. Stranded, deserted island. Okay. And you're only allowed to take three foods or food items with you. What would they be and why? Huh. I need, well, I don't know if the steaks are already cut. If not, I'm going to have to bring a whole bowl along because I... I can't. If it, uh, I need a steak once in a while. I can't live off the land for too long. <laughs> I, right. beef, beef is a large part of my life. I'd make an awful vegetarian. So, start with that. Um, you know what? Where, where obviously because of where I live, I'm a big fan of seafood, and I try to get as much as I can from like local vendors. So I really like shrimp, fish, a lot of stuff that's indigenous. Um, to hear. I don't know if that's too vague of an answer for you, but um, no, that's good. And and you know what? I, again, I guess based on where I live and having so many produce stands within a mile of my house, I don't know that I could live with without corn on the cob. <laughs> yeah, and I I said jokingly in the past that you you'd never see a sad person eating corn on the cob. You know, it's like that's that's humanity at their happiness, just chowing down on corn on the cob. So I guess if I had some steak, seafood and corn on the cob as my go to vegetable, I should be all right for a while. I like that. You never see a sad person chowing down on corn on the cob. <laughs> it's true. That's a keeper. That's a keeper. Hey, what if <laughs> if, if if there is one, what is a dish or a drink? That still, despite your years of experience, scares or intimidates you. Something you, that you feel the pit of your stomach drop when someone orders or y- you have to make in some realm. Huh. That's a good question. Uh, well, you got, you got all kinds of good ones. Um, I guess drink-wise, I always have 
for some reason, even though I've opened probably literally a million bottles, for some reason I always have just a little bit of trepidation about opening champagne or sparklings. Because I just always feel like that this is going to be the one that gets away from me, that pops and, you know, the cork goes across the room or I hit somebody in the face or or suddenly I'm spewing bubbles from a $120 bottle all over a guy's shirt. So I, I get I get a little anxiety about opening anything sparkling still to this day after what 30 years of doing it. Mm-hmm. Now, that makes that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Um Keith, I, I, I don't know if you've ever gotten a chance to read the My Last Supper series by Melanie Denea. No, I'm not familiar with it, but I'll look into it. Okay. So so long story short, um, each each book, there's two volumes currently where they ask 50 chefs. And admittedly, I stole the inspiration for this podcast from uh, Denea's concept of a standardized set of questions and to, to, to a group of chefs. Mm. So standard set of questions. And basically, the, the premise is, it's your last meal. How does it all play out? And so, Keith, I'll ask you, your, your last supper, who would be there? What would it be? Would there be music? What would be to drink? Frame it for me. Huh. Now, <clears throat> guess, are we going live, dead, past, present? Any, we, anybody? We or can go past or with, present. Uh, just people Does not who matter. exist. Yeah. Interesting. Um... Well, if I'm if I'm if I'm able to bring back the dead, I'm definitely first having my mother there. Um, and I think uh, Mark Twain, Thomas Jefferson, and George Carlin. If we're going with present day, it's uh all you know what all my relatives, my brothers, sister, their families, my dad, um, my my four kids, my wife, my in laws. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that there's nothing, nothing more important than family. So, which is another reason I don't own my own restaurant. Um, so yeah, I'm going to keep it family oriented <clears throat> other than the, the meeting of the minds going on in the other room that I already mentioned. Let's see. I think we're doing multiple courses. Um, we're going to start off as kind of a cocktail party of our own people come in, drink a choice, maybe, uh, you know, martini or what have you, um, with cheese. There's no such thing as too much cheese. We got, there are too many different kinds. So we'll say 10, 12, 15 varieties of cheese set up for him. And, uh, yeah, let's have bacon too. Just cause, just cause it's bacon. <laughs> yeah, it's my last supper. I'm not going to not have <laughs> bacon. Um, let's see, maybe, I don't know if I if we want to keep going with the cocktail party theme or eventually sit down at the table, but I definitely want multiple courses. You know, maybe some seared tuna, or I think you have the seared scallops where I work. That's uh, you know I, I never get tired of those. I've eaten that dish twice a week, every week for eight years, so might have to bring those along. Um, I'm feeling feeling probably steaks, uh, big thick ribeye, maybe a porterhouse or fillet. Um, accompanied by some shrimp and you know what my mother's crab cake not a maryland crab cake not an ocean city crab cake my mom's crab cake because i never have had a better one in my life and all the time i've lived in ocean city um so and since it's my last meal there's no point in saving any of the really good wine so let's blow through all of that and empty out the cellar um <laughs> and uh Let's see, I guess we'll go with some a couple of big bold California cabs with the main course. And then by the end of it, probably something in a snifter. And uh and if it were my last meal, I think I'd uh, I'd peacefully drift off to sleep after all of that. So I love it. Oh, I love it. That's 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 a brilliant response, man. That's well framed. Well framed. And finally, Keith, Thanks. last question. most simple question, but perhaps the most complex at the same time. What is food to you in a single word? Hmm. Um, wow. Unifying. Um, it, it just seems to be one of those things. It's, it's just one of the things that just brings people together. You know, a, a family event, whatever, uh, you know, a special occasion. There's always a meal involved and the right foods can bring together the right groups of people for all the right reasons and and even and people who otherwise would have nothing to do with each other can be brought together by food and i think that's pretty interesting you know i mean it's it's uh 
I mean, how many, you know, ethnic restaurants, you know, are there that, I mean, you, you maybe you and your wife go to on date night. I mean, I, you know, I'm all German, but I love to go out for Italian food or Mexican or sushi. So it's, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go with unifying. Unifying. Awesome. Awesome answer. Awesome answer. Awesome interview. Keith, that brings us to the end of our time together. Is there anywhere that I can plug for you today, sir? Um, well, I think you already did the uh, Galaxy 66 and Skybar plug pretty good. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess if you don't mind, I'm gonna even though I write it under a different name, I like to mention the uh, column. It's um, on the internet. There's uh, shorebread.com is the name of the website. Is about life in. It's basically about life in the Ocean City and the surrounding areas. And I do a tongue-in-cheek, almost autobiographical uh, column entitled "Shore Billy's Swill" under the name of Sid Nichols. That's uh, that's. That's my that's my sidebar and that's kind of fun. But uh, thank you. This was fun, Sean. I appreciate it. We'll do it again sometime. Absolutely, absolutely. Great time. Thank you so much, Keith, for your time again, folks. My guest, Commander in Chief of, I, I, I consider all of Ocean City, Maryland, bartending, but uh, get the Sky Bar atop Galaxy 66, Mr. Keith Raffensperger was my guest today. Again, episode seven. My producer is the Reverend Johnny Lamoria. Pleasure Sauce Podcast is his MO. Check it out. Again, my name is Sean Rossler, your host. We'll be back with episode eight, hopefully sooner than later. Until then, keep eating. Take care. Oh,